Welcome to our podcast, A Novel Talk, co-hosted by Carl Lee, and I'm Wendy Kendall. My mystery book, Cat Out of the Bag, that's cat with a K, is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, bookshop.org, and all over online and in your favorite bookstores. Katherine Watson, an international purse designer and amateur sleuth, goes from designer bags to body bags when she's faced with a puzzling murder mystery in her hometown of Bayside. Thank you to all the readers who've let me know how much they enjoyed the book and also the prequel, Perstachio Makes a Splash. Catherine and Mayor Brenda Derling investigate a chilling cold case, also available on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, and et cetera. And here is your co-host. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, my name is Carl Lee, and I write paranormal fantasy. Uh, someday I hope to have my book up on all of those lovely sites as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, Renee Patrick is the pseudonym for married authors Rosemary and Vince Keenan, authors of the Lillian Frost and Edith Head Mysteries. Rosemary is a research administrator and a poet. Rosemary has worked as an administrator at Seattle's Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center for over 20 years. She's a third place finisher on Jeopardy in 2005. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> Her poetry has been featured in Silver Birch Press's anthology, Noir Erasure Poetry. Vince is a screenwriter and a journalist. He started in the movie business as an usher and never looked back. He's enough of a film fanatic that he was a finalist on the IFC game show, Ultimate Film Fanatic. He's also been a video game writer and designer. In addition to their mystery series, his other book is Down the Hatch, One Man's One Year Odyssey Through Classic Cocktail Recipes and Lore. Both native New Yorkers, they currently live in Seattle, Washington. They've introduced movies at the famous Noir City Film Festival and on Turner Classic Movies. Thank you for joining us on A Novel Talk with Renee Patrick. Thank you for asking us. We're so happy to be here talking to you both. It's such a pleasure. So um, I was, you know, I okay. So you're married, and that may have that may have been the answer to the question. But how did <laughs> the two of you get started uh, collaborating as Renee Patrick? I have to say it was completely unplanned. It's not as if we had been sitting around saying we should find a project to work on together. It's it's not like we said at some point, oh, you know, when we're both retired, we'll write novels together. Um, the the simplest explanation is. Rosemary came up with the idea, and I just fell in love with it. That's it. Yeah, I was going to say the marriage really started it, but <laughs> then it just sat quietly for a while. <laughs> yeah, you know, when Vince said that he thought the idea was terrific, um, we just went with it. Yeah, exactly. I said she she we were in a coffee shop, and she said she had this idea that was floating around, and it was basically that Edith Head should start investigating crimes during the golden age of Hollywood with a with a sassy leg woman helping her out. And I said, if we don't do this at some point, someone else will think of this idea and I will never forgive myself yeah. if somebody else pounces on it. So we just, we just, we left the coffee shop then and like went home and started working. Excellent. Thank you for the idea because, oh my gosh, I just love this series. It's so <laughs> great. And the tantalizing word on your website ReneePatrickBooks.com is there are no secrets in a dressing room. I am immediately drawn in. <laughs> when, <laughs> when you're depicting 1930s Hollywood, including the studios, the stars' homes, the city itself, what is important in writing the descriptions of these iconic settings? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I think... One of the things that we do every time is that we're always looking for a historical detail that people may not know. 
that's always the, the the treasure that we're searching for when we do the researches. A lot of these locations are still standing. Uh, a lot of them uh, have enough written about them that people have some familiarity with them. And we always want to try to find some little nugget that might be new to people and build the entire thing around that. And we, we sort of know how we're going to go about it even before we, we start writing the books because often we'll pick the locations first. Right, and then just find a scene to set there. Um, in Script for Scandal, we have Howard Greer Salon. Yes, Edith Head was... Uh, kind of brought into the business by the designer Howard Greer. And when he left Paramount, he opened this oh, this fantastic salon in, in Los Angeles where all of the society women would come to get their clothes made. And we read uh, period descriptions of this from magazines and newspapers in the 1930s and said, yeah, definitely we need to have somebody be interrogated in this place. Right, it was a really big deal at the time and written up a lot and it's no longer stand. Well, the building is still there. The building course, is still there. The salon isn't, so... Um yeah, it was it was a nice little. And then for uh, the new book, The Sharpest Needle, um, that is set against. Uh, it, it's kind of like the early story just before Citizen Kane. So it's about Mary Davies and and William Randolph Hearst. So obviously, San Simeon mm -hmm. is going to be a location. But the big one that we knew we had to get into this book was the House of Westmore Beauty Parlor, which was. The salon that had been set up by all of the Westmore brothers who ran the makeup departments at pretty much every studio in town. And once we read about how this salon was set up, once again, we thought, this is a place where Lily needs to interrogate somebody. <laughs> Anything that involves glamour in Hollywood, we will find a way to get that location in. <laughs> I love the way that you say, we just have to find the location and then all we have to do is write the scene to go with it. <laughs> that's just yeah, it's, it, that's how it works. It sounds so easy. <laughs> it's, it's, not. it's weird how often the location will suggest the, like, the perfect kind of exchange to have there, though. It's, you know, once we start saying, okay, well, it's going to be a beauty parlor, what, what kind of things can, un can unfold there? Uh, a lot of times the scenes will just suggest themselves. Right, it just becomes so much fun. <laughs> to figure out what can happen. Our goal is to be accurate but fabulous as we cover all of these locations. Oh, I love that line. I love, that line. <laughs> I, love um, it. I also love old movies. I I am um, I'm a Turner Classic movie uh, kind of guy. Oh, you're um, a bus girl. <laughs> and actually, in my current project, old movies feature pretty prominently <laughs> uh, in it. Um, um, I I so so I love the fact that Edith Head is a detective. I think it's brilliant. Um, Edith Head is probably, you could list, rattle off a list of 10 uh, costume designers from old Hollywood, and I might recognize one or two other besides her, but I know exactly who Edith Head is. Um, where did you get the idea to have this Hollywood icon? <laughs> <laughs> as a detective which you know i just i don't know much about her personal life but it just doesn't costume design and private detective doesn't quite <laughs> mesh in my head <laughs> and yet it seems so natural wow us. <laughs> four books in <laughs> well it, it seems kind of natural to me too uh after this but well, where did I, the idea i came up with the idea i wanted to write an article about um, fashion, film fashion in noir um, for the Noir City Magazine. And so I started. That I'm the editor. It's just the yeah. editor. Um, and I really thought I could get it placed since my husband's the editor. Um, <laughs> so I'm doing research and I came across Edith Head, whose name I had known. But um, I just, as I've read more and more about her and about her life and about her career, which was, you know, decades and decades long, she worked forever, mm -hmm. it just occurred to me that. Well, she knew everybody, and and I love mysteries, and I'm like, well, what can we do with her? Well, we could make her a detective, because she knew everybody, and she knew their secrets, and she knew, you know, what kind of girdle they needed to wear to get the <laughs> illusion that they needed on screen. Yeah, that the, you know, she would always say that, that costume design was a combination of magic and camouflage, and it was all about knowing what the imperfections were and then keeping them secret, finding a way to, to, to mask them from the audience, which seemed actually like a good background for 
a private detective to have. And what I loved about it was we had the behind the scenes access and the fashion angle gave us a terrific avenue into exploring Hollywood at that time, because that's the thing I knew absolutely nothing about. The whole concept of fashion design was completely alien to me. And as Rosemary said, Edith's career was so long that we realized with her at the center of this, we had the ability to bring on anyone that we wanted as a character. For the length of her career, there would always be a way that we could we could hook somebody in. Like as I mentioned, this is the new book, Sharpest Needle, is is about the the run up to Citizen Kane, which means we wanted Orson Welles to be in the book, and Edith didn't work with him in any major way. Certainly not at that point in his career. And I thought, how are we going to get him? into the story and literally within like the first day's worth of research we found a completely plausible way to make Orson Welles and Edith Head be in the same room together. It's amazing the, the life that she had that just allows her to suddenly be in anyone's orbit. It's kind of like that Kevin Bacon game, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like three degrees of Edith Head because she really did know everyone. Exactly. Excellent, excellent. That's brilliant. Well, of course, with my own amateur sleuth being a purse designer, I have a passion for fashion also. What research do you do with the fabulous Hollywood gowns and costumes? And is there any especially memorable purse that was used by Edith Head in a movie? Okay. I'm gonna, You're going to take this one. I'm going to start <laughs> with that last piece first, because what a great question that is. Um, and I have an answer, and I think it has to be that Mark Cross overnight bag that Grace Kelly has in Rear Window, which oh. they still sell. They still sell it at Mark Cross, and it's called the Rear Window Overnight Bag, and it costs four thousand oh. dollars. If you're curious. Um, okay, I thought I had a Christmas gift lined up, but apparently yeah, not. It's maybe a little steep. <laughs> so, for me, that's that's amazing. That purse when Grace Kelly pulls the negligee out and you're like this bag is so tiny but she has all her other <laughs> things in there. fabulous i have to go re re-watch that movie now that's thank you what a great answer what about the rest of the gowns and costumes how do you go about researching these well we you know we have of course a lot of books about edith head and when we know kind of the time period where the book is going to be set we say okay well what movies was she working on at this time and so we'll pick ones where the costumes were very interesting or they're relevant to the story. Um, we go down a lot, or we used to before all this, <laughs> go down to Los Angeles and go to the Herrick Library where there are a lot of, a lot of background information about movie production. And of course we um, go to Paramount Pictures, which is where Edith was working. And we've been so lucky to get access to the archives there um, and to actually see some of the costumes um, that Edith made herself. It's just kind of amazing. That has actually happened where uh, you know, our friends down there said, well, what are the movies that you have in this book? And we'll give them a title and they'll you know, turn around to one of the racks that they have in the storage area and turn back around and we'll be holding the actual costume that Edith designed oh for that film. Oh my film. gosh. The original. Wow. Like, oh, this is what Barbara Stanwyck wore in The Lady Eve. Like, Can I touch it? <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, they actually right. let us touch it, which is in great. It just it boggles my mind still. They say, "Yeah, it's fine. No one's going to be wearing it today, so you can go ahead and touch it." <laughs> no wonder your books—they just the descriptions and everything just pop off the page. I mean, it's almost—it's not just the mystery that makes these page turners. It's the characters and the dis fabulous descriptions. And now I can see because you're you're getting it all really firsthand. It's been kind of amazing, and really, it's a, a dream come true to be able to go and talk to those folks about Hollywood history and to be standing in the buildings where the people we're writing about stood back in the 30s. Yeah, so when I think about uh, film noir, I head straight to the Maltese Falcon, the Black Dahlia. How would you guys define noir? That's, that is also a good question. I My picks, I would probably go with Double Indemnity and Out of the Past, just as the, the two, to me, the definitive movies to introduce somebody to noir. Um, I love Double Indemnity, too. Yeah. 
Well, as Rosemary mentioned, I'm the I'm the editor in chief of uh, Noir City, which is a magazine at the Film Noir Foundation, which was started by uh, Eddie Muller, who was the host of Noir Alley on Turner Classic Movies. And uh, when in doubt, you always quote the boss. So Eddie actually has two definitions of noir that I love, that I always down to fall to. The longer of the two is in noir, you know that what you're doing is wrong, but you do it anyway. <laughs> and I feel that that's true of any noir character that you would think of. And his other definition, which I think is more of a Rene Patrick definition, is suffering in style. <laughs> Love both of those. <laughs> That is so great. Um, as part of your research for The Sharpest Needle, the fourth in your series, you traveled to infamous Hearst Castle at San Simeon. I have also been there many, many years ago, but loved it. Can you tell us a little about this on-site research trip that you had? Well, that was that was also that was a dream come true for me to go there. It's someplace I've always wanted to go since I first learned about it when I was probably a teenager. And then there's a, there used to be this television show called America's Castles. And I remember seeing their episode about San Simeon. I was like, I need to go there, we have to go. <laughs> That's and, really the only reason we wrote this book. <laughs> it's, it's just to justify the trip. <laughs> we decided that we wanted to get there kind of in the way that Lillian and her, and the people who were visiting um, Marion and Hearst would go there. So we flew down to Los Angeles and then took the train mm. up to San Simeon, which was amazing. It's a beautiful ride right along the coast. Um, oh, it's, 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 it's like almost getting into a time machine because, I mean, rail travel is always is, has that fantastic effect on you anyway, where it just forces you to slow down. Yes. But this the, the the route that goes up to San Simeon is so hard along the Pacific. I mean, you can look out the window at certain points, and it's a straight drop down to the ocean. Oh. And there's a whole, like, an hour plus of the ride where there's absolutely no Wi-Fi at all. And you just <laughs> kind of sit there drinking. And by the time we got there, we felt like we'd actually kind of travel back a little bit. Yeah. Um, and so we were there for a couple of days and walked all around the grounds, took a few of the different tours that they offer of the castle itself and just kind of so soaked it in and loved it. It was just amazing. It was I mean, it's the, the, the property itself, like the, the vistas from anywhere you look on those grounds are just absolutely breathtaking. Um, it's interesting. The house itself is, an, is, is another story where that's actually something that we'd worked into the, the we would read a little bit about that going in and it, bore out when we were on the trip and it's reflected a little bit in the book is that it's the grounds that really make the impression on you the house itself is fine yeah take it over <laughs> <laughs> but just where it's set is just so absolutely amazing and we we took a, a fantastic kind of extended tour where they took us all through the area they took you down to see where the elephant seals were on the beach and mm -hmm. take you out to wineries and it was just it was really a, a great way to kind of experience what that part of the country might have been like back in back in Marion's time mm, beautiful yeah so you know from time traveling back to the past to time traveling to the near future um, your next book in the Lillian Frosty at Head series is out in February of next year. Um, yes. Can you can you give us some insight without giving the story away <laughs> about the crime uh, central to uh, this one? We'll try. I think we can try. <laughs> uh, it starts with some poison pen letters to Marion Davies, uh, making reference to a mysterious event in her past when she was a, a big star in silent film. And she turns to Lillian and Edith to find out who is behind these these scurrilous letters that she is receiving. And we kind of step back a little bit from that because the story is also set in August of 1939 and World War II is about to erupt in Europe. And that's kind of the subtext of the entire book is, is aspects of history being taken away from people, sometimes personal history, sometimes cultural history. Mm -hmm. um, because you know, Marion, for instance, was, was a big star in silent film, but never quite made the transition in the sound era. 
Charlie Chaplin is a character in the film who is someone who is still determined to prove that his approach to making movies works, that you could do a largely silent film and have it still play. Orson Welles is there and he represents the future of the movie business and, and is seen as a threat by a lot of the people who were there. And all of this kind of ties into what's, what's happening in Europe. So we try to weave all of those threads together with a lot of jokes and uh, pretty dresses. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> can hardly wait <laughs> well amidst all the glitter of Hollywood and its inhabitants is your character Lillian Frost such a wonderful transplanted New Yorker friend and movie fan can you talk a little about her and how you keep her from being overshadowed well Lillian is really the anchor of the story and she's the narrator Right? So it's everything is pretty much from her point of view. Yes. Um, and she is, she is, she's a big movie fan, but she's not easily starstruck. She comes from a family that has worked back on the East Coast, worked in the movie studios back there. So she understands that making movies is really hard work. You know, it's, it's magic on the screen, but it's hard work behind the scenes. Um, and I guess the other thing is that Lillian's got a lot of work to do in these books. <laughs> so she's got a, we, um, we kind of ripped off Nero Wolf in our conception of Lillian. We just, we just admit it. It's like, yeah. we're not going to say it's an homage or anything. We just, no. we just blatantly ripped it off. Because we wanted Edith to be there and be the person, kind of the, the She's the armchair detective. She's, yeah. you know, she can't, she can't leave the studio. She's, she's got all of these dresses to design. So, um, so yeah, Lillian takes up that slack and she's the one who is, going out and talking to people and bringing the information back and dealing with the cops. And yeah. and th we knew that to do that, much as in, in Rex Stout's book, that that character needed a distinctive voice. And so we, we put in a lot of time um, developing how Lillian sounds. And she sounds, kind of sounds a lot like Rosemary, I have to say. There's a <laughs> lot of Rosemary in Lillian. But then I also think there's a lot of, of Edith there, too, because Rosemary has, you know, she's... She, she runs a part of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, and she's she's a manager. And I kind of, I feel like we've drawn both sides of her personality and just, you know, split them in two and created these two characters around that. Oh, that's sure. really insightful. <laughs> no, really, that's good. Yeah, and great characters, too. Um, so uh, what challenges, if there are challenges, um, exist in coupling fictional characters with real life people and real life events with fictional events and, and merging them together in a, a fine mesh. <laughs> well, I, I, I always feel like this is a little bit of a spoiler, Carl, but I have to say the main issue that we have is that you know whenever you pick up one of these books that nobody famous is ever going to be the killer. This is the one what? thing that, we, that we've learned from the legal departments at our publishers in advance. It's like, no, 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 don't do that. And they actually went even further and said, you can't even have the relatives of famous people be the killer. Because if you say, oh, and the, the murderer is Clark Gable's nephew, he's got a nephew somewhere or the descendant <laughs> of a nephew somewhere. And they'll say, well, how dare you say this about my father? And then, you know, there'll be lawsuits galore. So that's always, that's tricky. But the main thing is we always, we want to make sure that the real people sound right, which mm -hmm. means both that they're, it's an accurate depiction of who they are, but it also kind of meets the impression that the reader might have of that person that they might bring to the page themselves. And that can be pretty tricky. And what we found a great resource for that is actually um, old time radio shows. Because so often the big stars would appear on these shows as exaggerated versions of themselves. And they were in on the joke and would, would lean into it. And it's, it's so easy to then kind of hear that voice in your head and then write more jokes for them on the page. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is perfect. That's been a great discovery for us. Excellent. Great answer. Yeah, that's very interesting. <laughs> Vincent, can you tell us a classic cocktail that pairs well with the sharpest needle which pre-ordered now ready for the february release 
Ah, <laughs> thanks for pointing that out. Yes, this is. Oh man, I I am so I was really thrown by this question because. <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, as I said, Charlie Chaplin is in this book, and there's a Charlie Chaplin cocktail that was named after him. So that was the first thought that I had. The problem is that drink is really kind of an acquired taste. <laughs> it's very much of a 1920s cocktail. It's got slow gin and apricot brandy, and I don't want to push that at anybody. Marion Davies, um, quite infamously at the time, uh, liked her tipple, which something that was something of an open secret in Hollywood, and a a source of tension between her and William Randolph first, actually. She loved gin, so I know it has to be a gin drink. And Orson Welles, also in the book, I know became very enamored of Campari when he went over to Italy in the 1940s to make a film called Black Magic. So I would say the Negroni. Under any circumstances, a Negroni is a good idea. But I would completely recommend the Negroni with this book and that again that's equal parts gin campari and sweet vermouth it will never steer you wrong <laughs> okay it's a personal favorite yes <laughs> i'm gonna i am definitely gonna try that awesome thank you <laughs> and report back to the uh listeners yes, <laughs> yes <laughs> I, I want to know how this goes over <laughs> Uh, speaking of our listeners, uh, could we convince you guys to do a brief reading from your uh, uh, current exciting novel? We would be uh, happy to do that. Certainly. Uh, we actually have something picked out. We just have to <laughs> very briefly setting it up. This is a scene where uh, it's kind of, it's, it's not like it's a tradition in the books, but there's always a big party scene. <laughs> and with Mary and Davies, we knew we had to have a scene at Mary and Davies' famous beach house in Santa Monica. So this is in just before that scene takes place. Lillian is going with Edith to the office of one of her colleagues at Paramount Pictures to ask for his help uh, in getting the police officers who'll be attending the party ready. The first floor of Paramount's dressing room building was where the biggest stars hung their hats and occasionally hair pieces given the comic actor Jack Oakey's predilection for pilfering the studio's wigs and nailing them to the dressing room ceilings of whoever had worn them last. Edith said the second floor was home to promising talent on the rise, so I was pleased to spy a door with the name of my friend starlet Brenda Baines. Winded, we reached the third, topmost level, the bulk of which had been given over to Wally Westmore's domain, the makeup department. The slender, ascetic Westmore greeted us in his office. Edith pointed to a golf club in the corner. Mr. Hope or Mr. Crosby? Both. They're arguing over that putter and apparently the grain of my carpet is splendid. Edith swiftly laid out her case to a skeptical Westmore. Only finishing touches required, she assured him. A few minutes of your time at most. Westmore sighed. Will I be paid for these few minutes? You'll be aiding the police department, Wally, and I'd consider it a personal favor. You had to say those two words, didn't you? Very well. My department will be at your disposal. You're not trying to fool the camera, the toughest audience of all, so you won't require all the artistry we can bring to bear. A few little tricks will suffice. It's amazing how simple they can be. Westmore lifted a coffee cup from a saucer on his desk. Instead of sipping from it, he held it out, expecting me to take it. I begrudgingly did so. Westmore then picked up the saucer and lit a match underneath it, letting it burn several inches beneath the saucer for a few seconds. He blew out the match and flipped the dish over, revealing a black smudge in the saucer's divot. Carbon. Add a few drops of baby oil, apply the mixture above the eyelashes, and blend to the edge of the eyebrow. All the cosmetics and technique in the world will not frame an eye more perfectly. What well, could be easier? He wiped the carbon away and set the saucer down brusquely, as if it had insulted him. You know who taught me that? Diedrich. Ah, Marlena, he had sighed. We should all follow her beauty advice. No, we shouldn't, Westmore said. I'd be out of a job. Who doesn't have a kitchen match? I held the coffee cup out to him. He didn't take it. I set it on the saucer with a gentle, satisfying click. Awesome. That was excellent. Thank you so much. I'm sure everyone Our pleasure. It. <laughs> this is such a good book. You are all going to love this. Uh, just you listeners, you want to get out and get this book. And if you haven't, started the series go ahead and pre-order this one and get going on reading the rest of the series because it's a good one and um thank you so much rosemary and vince for joining us for a novel talk
<laughs> Our Thank pleasure. You. Thanks so That's much. Great. Listeners are going to want to check out your website, ReneePatrickBooks.com. And a thank you to our listeners for tuning in. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And remember, a novel read leads to a novel talk.